online. It's so good to have you have you here, and uh, you've probably noticed but driving around or at uh, at, at the mall or kind of anywhere. I mean, it's it's uh, uh, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, right? Uh, even even around here. So uh, uh, excited for that. Um, did want to let you know if you'd put a couple of things on your calendars. Um, Saturday, the 14th of December, just a few weeks from now, um, we're going to have our uh, Christmas potluck. I'll uh, be able to do that here this year, and uh, we'll have some more information coming in the weeks the weeks to come about that. Uh, still kind of putting some final plans together on that, but the date is set, so that's Saturday, the 14th, um, and it'll be just a great time of fellowship. Uh, time to just come together and again just praise the Lord and so thankful for all that he's he's done for us individually but as a church this past year so we'll celebrate that and uh, we're working on a few other uh, special little things for that evening but also this year really excited about the fact that we're going to be able to have our own Christmas Eve service on Christmas Eve we've always had to work around a different schedule because we haven't had our own building but now that uh, the Lord has blessed us here we will actually be on Christmas Eve which is a Tuesday this year we're going to have a candlelight service here, um, and so uh, really, I'm so, so looking forward to that. And uh, it's also a great time to invite family, friends, neighbors, um, because they're a little bit more open to a Christmas Eve, you know, service to be able to come and, and even if they're, even if they're not believers, invite them, um, hear the gospel and what a, what a, what a great night to get saved on Christmas Eve. Amen. So, uh, please invite those that you know. And again, we'll have more um, information about timing and everything on that, but, uh, just wanted to make you aware of those couple of things. All right. So Galatians chapter two, if you don't have a Bible with you today, um, please slip your hand in the air. We do have some extras marked to the passage that we're in. Uh, we can bring that to you. Galatians chapter 2. We have come as far as verse 11. So if you will follow along with me, Galatians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, Paul writes, But when Cephas, that is Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James... He used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of them all, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. But, verse 17, if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For, the, for through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. Verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. We've mentioned as we've gone through these first uh, few times together going through this letter to the churches in Galatia, that Paul was dealing with a very real thing that was going on in the churches there and throughout the entire area, these Judaizers that were coming in and they were bringing in this heresy that said, okay, yeah, Jesus, great, yep, died for our sins, perfect, but in order to be truly saved, you need to become Jewish first. And then, then you can be saved by faith in Jesus. You need, it's, it's faith, yes, but circumcision. Faith in addition to these things. And so Paul addressing this in order to, again, add 
add some credibility back into the message that he's bringing and in order to met, let them understand that this message that he brought to them, that, that, that they believed, that they listened to and placed their faith in, didn't come from man. It actually came directly from Jesus himself to Paul when he met him on the, on the road to Damascus. He said it didn't come from men. It didn't come from Peter and James and John, these other pillars of the early church. It didn't come from that. It came from Jesus directly. But he also, as we looked at last week, he didn't want to make it sound like they were from two separate camps. As a matter of fact, the whole point was there is one gospel. There is one God. There is one gospel. There is one way to be reconciled to God, and that is through Jesus Christ and through faith in him alone. Both Peter, James, John, all of, the, all of those others, and Paul have the same gospel message, uni unity in that, the same spirit moving among them. It's where we left off last week. Notice the first word in our text today in verse 11. But, Paul says all of that to line up, to this next point, he said, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. He opposed who? Peter, the apostle Peter, the one that we see throughout the gospels, the one that spent all of that time with Jesus, the one who stood up on Pentecost and gave the message where 3,000 were saved, that Peter. It tells us that he visited Antioch. That's not recorded anywhere else in Scripture, so we don't have any details around that. But Peter came to Antioch, no doubt, to, to see what's going on in the church there with Paul and Barnabas, hearing everything that's going on, no doubt to be an encouragement. And when he got there, the church in Antioch was largely made up of Gentile believers. And so when Peter gets there, it tells us that he's hanging out with them, he's eating with them, he's enjoying fellowship with them. But... When a group that came from Jerusalem, it says that, that were sent the, uh, certain men from James, the, the, the leader of the, the church there in Jerusalem, they, he hears that they're coming, all of a sudden he starts pulling away from them. He starts, he starts distancing himself from the Gentile believers. And it tells us here that he opposed him, he called him out on it, because he's walking out a different message. He's, he, P Peter was the one, if we see in Acts chapters 10 and 11, Peter was the one who saw in a vision a Gentile by the name of Cornelius calling out to have him come and share the gospel. And Cornelius had, had, the, had a vision at the same time. God is lining all of this up through his providence, lining this, this up so that Cornelius would, would send a group to go get Peter to come. Peter sees this incredible vision, and it's this sheet that is brought down from heaven. And inside of the sheet are all of these animals that prior to, they were forbidden as Jews to eat the, the, the meat from these animals. No doubt, maybe a pig in there, probably. And inside the sheet it says, and then the, the voice of God says to Peter, Peter, get up, kill, and eat. And Peter's response is, by no means, Lord. I would never, ever, ever touch that, much less put it in my mouth. Jesus' response to Peter was, Peter, do not call unclean what I have declared to be clean. Now, Jesus' point in all of that wasn't to say, hey, bacon's okay. That wasn't the point. The point was, the blood of Jesus has cleansed all. And salvation is available to all, yes. not just the Jews, but to Gentiles. And all the Gentiles said, Amen! Right? Praise God that that is opened up to us. Mm -hmm. And Paul, Peter knew this, right? I mean, Peter stood up for this. Peter was the first one to go to the Gentiles. When he, when he came back from Cornelius, by the way, he goes to Cornelius. He's obedient in that. He shares the gospel. Cornelius and all of his family get saved get baptized, Peter goes back and he's telling the Jewish believers in Jerusalem everything that's going on, and they're like, no way. He's going, yes. And he tells them the story about it, and then they start praising God. So all of this is going on. Now here, this same Peter is now pulling away. And it tells us why. He was worried about fearing the party of the circumcision, that some of these that are holding on to these Jewish traditions still might look at him differently. Now remember, Peter is a part of that church in Jerusalem that is largely made up of Jewish believers, and he's worried about maybe his standing there, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And it tells us that he stood condemned. Now, please know what that means. It does not mean that Peter lost his salvation in that moment. 
It is not talking about standing condemned eternally before God. The Bible is very clear. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We know that for an absolute fact. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Nothing. What is it speaking of there? Well, his own actions. The things that he is doing. The things that he is that he's saying one thing and he's doing something else. He's not eternally condemned before God. No, he is momentarily condemned, if you would, before man and himself. No doubt he knows, as the Holy Spirit revealing within him, that his, his actions are wrong, what it is that he's doing. And he gives us an explanation for that in verse 12. For prior to the coming of these men of James, he's saying one thing. He's doing one thing in this moment, but now others are coming, so he starts to do something different. And guys, that is so extremely dangerous. He goes on to tell us exactly what that is in verse 13, right? It's listed there twice. Hypocrisy. He drops the H-bomb on him. Hypocrisy. Nobody likes to be called a hypocrite, right? But what is hypocrisy? It literally means, the Greek word literally means wearing a mask. Being something different than, than you are. Pretending to be something one place and pretending to be something else somewhere else doing this different thing. Hypocrisy. They're not walking straight forward. They're not walking straight in verse 14, it says. And it's so dangerous because the world around us sees. When we take a stand that we are Christians, whether, whether our lives are reflecting it or not, but if, we're, if, we're, if we have the bumper sticker, if we have whatever, if we're proclaiming that, guys, people are watching us. Our neighbors are watching us. Our family is watching us. And if we start acting like the world, if we start acting hypocr hypocritically, that, that turns them away. They're like, you know, I can get that anywhere. What, what's so special? What's so different about you? So it damages the, our, our message but it even goes farther than that, and that's where Paul is calling him out here. It does huge damage to the church. It does damage to other Christians. Not just weak Christians, by the way. Not just those that are new in their faith or weak in their faith. I think this is so important. Verse 13, the rest of the Jews, all that were a part of that church that were Jewish, looked to Peter and started pulling away, including Barnabas. We've talked about Barnabas the last couple of weeks. He was drawn away into that. Can you imagine? All, and and the, the Gentile believers, as they're watching this happen and they're starting to pull away, they're like, what's going on? It tells us, again, the main thing is the reason. Fearing the party of the circumcision. The desire to please men. And... We all struggle with that, right? I mean, I don't know that we ever get to that place where we say, you know what, I don't really care what anybody else thinks. We can say that, but there's that part of us that, you know, I, I, I really do care what people think. <laughs> and how many of you know it's really hard to please anybody completely, right? <laughs> Much less pleasing everybody. And when we go out of our way to please people, guys, one of the first things that happens is we lose sight of pleasing God. Mm -hmm. We lose sight of living a life that is pleasing to him and honoring him. We place others' opinions of us and everything else above what it is from them. And, and it's not just that, too. Notice fearing the party of the circumcision. And why was that certain, so important? Certain men from James, these influential men, these power men, that's where it can really be dangerous for us, too. All of a sudden, I, I know that certain so-and-so is coming or certain whatever is, is, is going on, so I'm going to act differently because, well, it's, it's my boss's boss or it's whatever it might be because I want to impress. James, by the way, it says certain men from James. We've mentioned this. That's Jesus' half-brother. James wrote the book of James, and he writes this in, in, in his letter, James chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. He says, My brethren, do not hold your faith in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. And what he's speaking of in that is that I'm going to give favor to somebody else in hoping that that will then pay me back at some point. So personal favoritism, for if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing fine clothes and say, you sit here in the good place, 
and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Again, calling it out, that's an evil heart that places certain status on other people to try to impress them and others that we look down upon or put into this other category. Guys, that is so opposite of our Lord Jesus. When he was here, he wasn't out trying to impress the religious, the religious elite. He wasn't trying to get them on board. He's thinking, you know, this, is, this will be my quickest way to the top if I can get all of them to buy in. Or, you know, it might even be better as Jesus' PR guy. Hey, let's go to Rome. Let's get Caesar on board. If we could get Caesar, could you imagine? I mean, we'll be working Caesar's palace. I mean, we'll, be, we'll, we'll have the audience. I mean, we'll have all of this. And can you imagine the money? Can you imagine? All? Jesus didn't care about any of that. Any of that. Who did Jesus go to? He went to the, the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the, and the sinners, right? I, I'm, I'm so proud of the heritage of Calvary Chapel, going back to the beginning to be a part of what the Calvary Chapel movement back in its early days. I wasn't a part of it then, but to hear the stories and to see all of that and how Pastor Chuck and his wife Kay and, and their family and, and then as the church began to grow, but their heart that they had for what every other church was keeping out, pushing out the hippies. You, know, you dirty, filthy hippies, you know, take a shower and then come back or whatever. No, Pastor Chuck said, let them come in. Let them come in. They need to hear the word of God. And as the word of God and the Holy Spirit of God began to start transforming and changing lives, it, guys, it changed the culture. And again, it was because they weren't worried about what certain people thought. As a matter of fact, very clear. There's a lot of stories about how some of the elite within the church at that time started leaving the church because they're like, you're going to let them come in here? As a matter of fact, yes. And all of their friends. And God blessed that movement so much. Well, back to our text. Paul confronts Peter very firmly, but yes, with an attitude of love, absolutely. Confronted him to his face in the presence of all. We need to pause right there. Because this is an extremely, extremely, extremely unique situation. Do not use this as a verse that says this is how we are to handle disputes in the church. <laughs> as a matter of fact, the Bible is very clear. If there are issues between us as believers, we are to deal with those things privately. Not in front of a group of people. This was extremely unique. It needed to be dealt with quickly and publicly. Why? Well, we've covered it already, largely, but because verse 13, the rest of the Jews joined in. This happened very quickly, and it started to separate the church. And Peter, again, being the, a leader, Paul being a leader, this needed to be addressed face-to-face -face right away before things got out of control. And so, Paul calls Peter out on this. And also, most disputes, most things that go on between Christians are not doctrinal issues. They're differences of opinion, they're personality conflicts, they're different things like that, that by the grace of God and the Spirit of God moving amongst believers gets worked out as we, as we go to a brother or sister in private, we pray about things and we do that. This, guys, is dealing with probably, possibly, one of the most vital Christian doctrines that there is. Salvation through faith alone in Christ alone. Justification by faith. And to pull away from that, that somehow now we as Jewish believers are better? Again, Paul is, is calling him out. Peter, you know this. We're declared righteous all the same way by the blood of Jesus. Notice he, he uses the term justified. And by the way, when we look at this, when it says, I, I said to, to Cephas, to Peter, in the presence of all, it starts midway through verse 14, and his, his, his commentary to, to Peter that is recorded goes all the way through verse 21. So this is the entire dialogue that is taking place. 
And notice he jumps right into the fact that we are justified not by works, but by faith. He says it three times in verse 16. Now, when we get to chapter 3 next week and following, we're going to get start to unpack some of those things. Faith and law and redemption and those things as he, as he starts going directly to the Galatian church and talking to them about that in chapter 3. But he's, he's dealing here now how he dealt with it with Peter. And he goes to him again he's, and he says, Peter, you and I are Jewish. We were born into this. We are by nature Jews. But his whole point in verse 16 is, that doesn't matter when it comes to salvation. We're saved the same way. There was this pride factor with the Jews that they were, they were this elevated status of people that somehow they were chosen by God because they're super special. No, they were special because they were chosen by God. Deuteronomy chapter 7 says, The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were fewest of all the peoples. One, Abraham. Because the Lord loved you and kept an oath which he swore to your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. The Lord brought you out by his mighty hand and redeemed you from a house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Set them apart for purpose, which they failed in over and over again. And Paul's point is, Peter, why would we expect them to do what we didn't? We're saved by faith, not because we're Jewish. And you know this, Peter. Again, this is the whole point that he's bringing out. They're saved just like we are. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, it does not tell us what Peter's response to all of this is. However, we can put the connect the dots, two, to two plus two, we can, we can do all of that. And I believe, I told you last week, the Bible doesn't tell us which trips we were talking about. I believe all of this took place before the Jerusalem Council. And in the Jerusalem Council, Peter stands up and again makes the defense of salvation by faith alone, through Christ alone, for the Gentiles and for the Jews. So that's my personal, my personal timeline as to how all of this happened, that Peter started wavering off course, Paul corrects him, he repents, and then he stands up in front of everybody, James included, and makes the defense that we looked at, that we looked at last week. But 17, as he goes through this, and he's talking about this, and I do want to kind of take a little sidestep here today, and we'll pick this back up again as we get into chapter 3 and following, but notice verse 17, he says, but... He's talking about being saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That, that, that is it. But he says, then he says, but if while seeking to be justified in Christ, yes, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then the minister of sin? May it never be. What is, what, what's he asking there? Well, as I've mentioned to you before, the best commentary on the Bible, if you want to get, if you want to get the best commentary on the Bible, you're already holding it. The best commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself. So if you would turn with me to Romans chapter 6, because this is not an isolated question. Um, it's not a kind of a one-time thing that he's dealing with, as a matter of fact. Um, this is very, very prominent, both back then and now. Um, this idea that, okay, saved by grace. Grace alone. So does that mean I can just keep on sinning then? Give God every opportunity to display as much grace as possible? I'm actually doing God a favor. I'm, I can, you know, be, be, on that, be out on the front lines of his PR team by showing, look at how much grace I get because of how much, of course not. Of course not. And we, sat, we, make it, we, we say that, that that's crazy. Who would ever think that? Well, they might not say it that way, but very many, a lot of Christendom, quote unquote, today propagates that. You don't have to change anything in your life. Just add Jesus as an accessory and everything's fine. Well, Paul addresses that in Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? And again, we, may, we think that's such a silly question. But he says it several different times in different letters. Obviously, this is an issue. And again, still an issue today. Notice verse 2. May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too, notice, might walk in the newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, 
certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. His answer again, so do we just keep on sinning? His, the most emphatic answer you can give in the Greek in the negative is what is said here. It's like, no, no, a thousand times no, absolutely not. Grace, guys, is not a license to do as we please. It's the power to do as we should. And he says, how shall we, shall we, how shall we, speaking again of us, how shall we, being in Christ Jesus, being baptized into Christ Jesus, who in what we are in Christ is the focal point of all of this? We need to start and understand our position before we can discuss our practice. And that's the problem of getting those two things out of order. We must first embrace our position, who we are in Christ, before we work it out practically. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. We sang that in the chorus of one of the songs earlier. New things before us. We are a new creation. Now, very important, the, the, the grammar in this, and I wanna, I'm going to go slow through some of these things because it's so important. We can read through this and miss the importance of it. Notice verse 2. May it never be, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? Please notice it does not say that we who ought to be dead. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say we who are dying to sin. No, it's actually in what's called the aortist tense in the Greek, which means it points to a completed act in the past that has ongoing continual results now. What does that mean? This is not a process. This is not speaking of sanctification. Sanctification is a process. That is not what is being talked about here. It is something that already happened to us as Christians. It's not something that we do or that we did. It's something that happened to us. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us in verse 1 that we were once dead in sin. What we see here now is we are now dead to sin. Now, another important thing that probably does not show up, as I read in the New American Standard, it does not show up in our text, but it's an important thing. And if you're a note taker, put this in here. Because in the text, it is there, the definitive article. And what does that mean? Well, the word the. Very important. And I'm going to put it in where it's supposed to be. Verse 2, may it never be, how shall we who died to the sin still live in it? The sin. What is that speaking of, the sin? Well, that's why we need to read in context. Because chapter 5 tells us what the sin is. It's speaking of the sin nature. It's talking about the fact that we as human beings are descendants of Adam and with that we have in all inherited the sin nature from Adam. So he's saying here how who have we who have died to that sin nature still live in it as though we are alive in it. It is a controlling power. Let, let's just jump back there real quick. Chapter 5 verse 17. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, and he's talking about Adam, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. He's talking about what rules and reigns in our lives. Prior to salvation, guys, sin ruled over us. That sin nature that we all inherited because we are descendants of Adam. That controlling, ruthless, tyrant sin. Jesus took that upon himself. Jesus, and again, as we're coming into the Christmas season, Jesus born of the Virgin Mary. That is why the virgin birth, guys, is not a negotiable thing when it comes to Christians. 
Some will say, hey, you know what? I'm totally fine. You and I are just alike. We're just fine. I just don't believe in the virgin birth. I don't believe that's possible. Guys, that is, that is a defining thing for us as Christians. Why? Because Jesus could not be born the same way you and I are because if He was, He would have inherited the sin nature. And He would have been sinners from birth just like us. But He was born of, a, born of the Virgin Mary. Did not inherit that sin nature. But when He went to the cross, guys, He took all the sin upon Himself. He rose again victorious. And He sets us free. The Son sets free is free indeed. We have a new Lord. We have a new power. We died to that reign of sin. We looked at verse 17. Look at verse 21 in chapter 5. Again, just right back a couple of verses. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are under the reign of grace now. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. Took us out of this kingdom, this domain, and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. Guys, he didn't just forgive us of our sins. He transferred us from the tyrant of sin and death to the glorious kingdom of Jesus. Hallelujah. It's not either or. It's both and. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and his question is, and, it, and the, the bottom line is it can't, but he, he, put, he poses the question, how who we who have died to the sin, we've died to that nature, still live in it? We can't live in it. If you are truly a born-again believer, guys, it's an impossibility. We can't live in both. Now, again, the Bible, as the best commentary for the Bible, if you turn there quickly, if not, just jot it down. We'll jump there really fast. The book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 3 gives us a very clear description of what it is that Paul is talking about right here. 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse 3, it says, Everyone who has this hope, what hope is that? The hope that we will see Jesus one day as he is, and we will be like him. That transformation of us being transformed more and more into his, his image will have completed its takes when we stand there glorified in his presence. Everyone who has this hope on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Verse 4, everyone who practices sin, please notice, practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared, Jesus appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. We are in Christ Jesus. No one who, here it is, abides in him, that is the key, abiding in Christ, that's what Jesus himself said, abide in me and I in you. Abiding in him, no one who abides in him sins. And I'm going to show you, this does not mean that we never sin. It means that we are not in that sin nature anymore. And he clarifies that here. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children, make sure that no one deceives you. And here it comes. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one, nor the one who does not love his brother. Again, a change of direction, a change of rulership in our lives. We go from relishing sin and living in it and having no problem with it at all and loving that to seeking to live a life that pleases God and the ability to do so. Now, does that mean that we can all, we can fall back into sin? Absolutely. Unfortunately. But... When we do, 
The Holy Spirit brings conviction. We're miserable in that state. If you're, it, it, again, we, we, can all, we can all relate to this. Before being saved, my sin never bothered me. The consequences kind of stunk every once in a while, but it didn't bother me at all to sin and to keep on doing it and to keep on running and to keep on going. But now, when, I, when the Holy Spirit brings that conviction, I'm broken over that. We, don't, we stop justifying ourselves. We stop excusing our sin. Worst of all, we stop authorizing sin. We repent. Repentance. Beautiful word, by the way. Many people think of it as like this big negative or big, you know, heavy word. It's the most freeing word because repentance means turning around, turning away. And evidence that you once repented in your life is that you continue to repent in your life. As the Holy Spirit brings conviction to us, we repent and we turn back. We no longer abide in sin. We abide in Christ. We are freed from that. We can't still live in it, is what it says. I, I mentioned this before. It's one of my favorite quotes from Adrian Rogers. God, God bless him, and he's with, been with the Lord now for many years. But he said, being a Christian does not mean that you don't sin anymore. It means that you don't sin and enjoy it anymore. And there's that moment, you know, again, but that's followed immediately as Christians by like, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry. That's, I, that's not me anymore. And we know that. Again, because it is now dead. Or do you, back to, back to Romans 6, or do you not know, verse 3, do you not know, we should all know this, that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. Baptized. What does that mean? Again, not water baptism. We've covered this the last couple of weeks. Water baptism is that outward symbol, that outward display of something that's already taken place in, inwardly. Baptism, he goes on to tell us, is that full identification with Christ Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection. Verse 5, for if we have become united with him, him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Full identification. His death, burial, resurrection. Death. The ending of something, right? Burial. The proof of death. Correct? Resurrection. What is that? New life. <laughs> Praise God. Since we are in Christ and He is in us, we have that new life. We're going to come back to Galatians here as we close out, but Galatians 2.20, again, I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. In this life that I now live in faith, in the flesh, I live in faith in the One who loved me and gave Himself for me. All of us, he says, all of us, in verse 3, all of us as Christians are united with Christ when? At regeneration. When we are born again. It is not phase two of our salvation. <laughs> now please let me emphasize this. This is not an experience. It's not a feeling. It's an accomplished fact. God has taken us out of Adam and placed us into Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30 and 31. By his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. By his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. Not will be. We are. Into Christ Jesus. Again, all of Him. <laughs> not part of Him. Jesus isn't compartmentalized. He's not, there aren't pieces of Jesus. Now, we might realize this in stages as we grow, and that is sanctification. As we understand those things, as we, as we learn to walk in the reality that is ours, 
The fact, and we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, Romans 8, 29 and 30, right? It talks about the fact that those, well, jump over there, one page over. Verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that we would be the, he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. All in the past tense. In God's economy, it's all done already. Even though we are recognizing that in different stages as we move along. All that was true in Adam is true in us. And that's the inconvenient truth, that we inherited that. It's inconvenient, but it's true nonetheless. We can fight it, we can argue it, we can say that's not fair, we can do whatever we want to, but it's reality. All that was in Adam is in us prior to regeneration. Guys, on this side of the cross, all that is in Jesus is ours. That's the inconceivable truth. That's like, that, that, doesn't, that, that doesn't compute either. But pray just as much as this is true, this is true for those of us who, who believe. Into his death, we all sinned in Adam. We all died in Christ. When he died, I died. When he died, you died. Again, this is not an experience. It's not a feeling. How do we know it's true? Because God said so. Because the Word of God tells us that when Jesus died, I died. When He was buried, showing that His death was final, my death was final. And when he rose again, victorious over death, so did I. So did you. Again, burial, that's that final proof of death. It proved that the rule of sin over our lives, guys, is over. So that as Christ was raised, death could not hold him. (laughs) Could not hold him. It's not that, you know, when Jesus said, it is finished, and they took him down from the cross and they put him in the tomb, heaven wasn't pacing back and forth and every, all the, God, God, uh, the Father up there going, okay, now what do we do? What do we do? Uh, I sure hope three days later it works out like we planned. There was no question. Death did all it could, but it failed. What Jesus did to death is final. So that we too might, and here it comes, guys, verse 4. So that we too might walk in the newness of life. On the other side is life. We need to walk in it. (laughs) It's not just for the forgiveness of our sins. Praise God for that. Heaven, heaven, future. It's, yes. But it's not just that. It's so much more. Here and now. That we can walk in the newness of life. We can walk in a way that pleases Him and honors Him. We can walk in a way that others see and want to know. We can walk in a way that is salt and light. We don't have to be hypocrites. We don't have to live in a way and and, and fall back into those things. We have the power now. Again, it's not will be. (laughs) It's not that as as we move through in our Christian walk, we, God gives us more stuff in order to help us become better, to be able to do it. Do you know when we get all of those things? We already have them. Second Peter 1 verse 3 says, His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. Guys, we already have it. All of the things that we need. We just need to appropriate them. And that's where, we, that's where we, we pray and we spend time in His Word. Iron sharpening iron. We come alongside one another. We, we walk this walk out together and we, and we grow in this, but we already have everything. I don't know. Maybe you're here today. I've been there before in my walk. I've, I've, God doesn't let me use the excuse anymore, but I, maybe you're there. Well, someday. Someday, when God does this for me and and this type of thing, then I'll start serving the Lord. Then I'll start walking for this and everything. You already have everything you need to live a life that fully pleases God. Fully pleases Him. 
And we are to work that out. We need to work out what God has already worked in. Colossians 1.29, For this purpose I also labor, striving according to His power which works mightily in me. I love how that, wor- that verse folds out. Because at the beginning it sounds like striving works. But then he says, oh, well, no, I'm just basically unleashing the power that the Lord has placed within me. <laughs> and yes, that, that involves work on our end. But it's work through his power, his energy. He is the one that is working it out through us. Now, again, just to underscore this as we kind of transition back, but stay here real quick in, in Romans chapter 8. Because sometimes, you know, we can get this whole back and forth. That's why I wanted to jump off here and spend this time because we're going to go back into the fact again that it's not through the law, it's through faith in, in that. But we, can, we, we don't disconnect those two things. We talked about this yesterday at the men's Bible study because we went through James this week in the one-year Bible. You know, it's not faith and works that saves you, but it's a faith that works that saves you. Our faith should produce fruit. If it's not, we should question the faith. Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with the law, but to fulfill it. And we see again, Paul defines that for us, what what Jesus means by that in chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 2. For the, law of the spirit of, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it once was through the flesh, God did. Sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh, so that, here it is, the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. The requirement of the law never changes. God's law is eternal. The requirement of that law never changes. But we're now able to, because of what Jesus did, we're able to now fulfill that. Turn back to chapter 7 of Romans. I love this verse. Romans 7, verse 6. But now we have been released from the law. Does that mean, again, that we, all of the things of the law no matter don't apply to us anymore? Mm-hmm. Not at all. Having died to that by which we were bound, here it is, so that... We serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Guys, the what didn't change. The how did. We no longer do it in our flesh. We no longer do it in our own efforts. We do it because the Spirit of the living God lives within us. And we have the power to live that life that is pleasing to Him. And so, with that, back to Galatians chapter 2. And we'll close here. Again, verse 19 goes hand in hand with what we've just been talking about. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. It didn't eliminate the law. What it did is it now gives me the ability to live for God. And verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Was was Christ some lawbreaker and throwing the law? No, He fulfilled the law. He's perfect. He now lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. What an, what an amazing declaration. And I, I've, I've shared this before and i've been in seasons in my life where i did this and i'm back to being challenged to do this i've been trying to do it throughout this week and weeks moving forward but galatians 2 20 um a few, couple of years ago god really kind of pressed it on my heart to pray galatians 2 20 as a prayer as opposed to just reading that turning it into a, a personal thing and it, it it was very powerful for me so i want to we're gonna we're gonna close this today with this way in our prayer but i challenge you in that too Make Galatians 2.20 a personal prayer to you, for, between you and the Lord and uh, see if it doesn't, again, bring that, d- just that connection to where it's like, uh, the, um, again, the how, right? To be able to walk it out and just the encouragement that comes from that. So let's, let's close. Let's, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we have been crucified with you. And it is no longer we who live, but you live in us. In the life which we now live in the flesh, we live by faith in you, who loved us and gave yourself for us. Lord, help us to understand the magnitude of that 
truth. As we've spent time today in your word, we pray that you would open up our minds and open up our hearts. And Holy Spirit, that you would reveal the depth of the truth of what we've been talking about today. The fact that Jesus suffered and died is a historical fact. But your word tells us that when he did, it was just as much of a historical fact that we died with him. And when he was buried, we were buried. And when he rose again, we rose again. Lord, help us to, ident to see that and to be able to grab a hold of the truth that because of that, we can now walk in the newness of life. The life that you have given to us so freely to us. Lord, we still battle. Your word tells us that until we, till we stand with you in glory, our flesh is going to battle the Spirit. Lord, we praise you for the battle. But because, because beforehand we didn't fight. We didn't put up a fight. But we thank you, Lord. We thank you for repentance. We thank you for the gift of grace. And Lord, we pray that this week, as we, as we go into a week of, of thanksgiving, yes, but no doubt a week of, of uh, some <laughs> great opportunity. Let's put it that way, Lord. Great opportunity to spend time with, with family that don't know you. With friends that, that maybe even make fun of us because of our beliefs. Lord, that we would not cower from that. That we would not change who we are in front of that. But Lord, that we would be lights in the darkness that we would be salt, that we would be usable by you for your glory, for your kingdom purposes. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's stand. Let's close together in one last song.